Uh, now let's just get started. Uh, so my name is Ken Field. I'm the uh, president of uh, Jazz Boston, and uh, I'm uh, pleased to be coordinating this uh, series of forums with Kevin Harris, who's on our board of directors. Uh, we've been uh, Kevin. Kevin and I have been thinking about various uh, topics for forums, uh, and we. Uh, had a conversation with uh, members of the mayor's office of arts and culture um, a month or so ago, and this idea came up. We thought it was a really good idea for for a forum, a forum on spirituality and jazz. And uh, you're going to hear from a number of uh, great panelists who have a lot of uh, very interesting things to say. Uh, I do want to announce that uh, Annette Phillip is unable to join us, uh, unfortunately this evening um so uh she had a bit of an emergency so uh, we send out our our thoughts and prayers to her and hope things work out well for her um i also want to mention that uh i said jazz boston is the organization that's presenting this uh jazz boston is an organization that's been around for about 15 years it's an advocacy organization uh in support of the boston area jazz community that community includes musicians, includes audiences, includes the media, and includes uh, venues and presenters. Uh, we're trying to do what we can to support all that whole jazz community. And if you would like to join us in supporting that community, we hope you would, you could become a free member of Jazz Boston. Doesn't cost anything. Just go to jazzboston.org and uh, you'll see a place on there where you can join up as a member. It basically means you'll get a newsletter from us every month and um, uh, we'll tell you what's going on. There's a lot going on uh, and you'll hear about things like this, uh, some initiatives we have with GBH streaming uh, jazz concerts and some other things that we're doing. So we hope you will join. Just go to jazzboston.org and join up. So I would like to um, introduce our host for the evening, uh, Dr. Emmett Price III. Uh, Emmett is one of the nation's leading experts on the Black Christian experience, Christian workshop, uh, I'm sorry, Christian worship, and the music of the African diaspora. Uh, Dr. Price is an ordained minister and is a regular contributor to GBH's public, Boston Public Radio segment, All Revved Up. He served as guest lecturer at over 40 universities worldwide. As a professional musician, he's performed throughout the US, the Caribbean, the UK, France. He's the former CEO and board chair of Jazz Boston and is the chair of the board of directors of the Emanuel Gospel Center. Dr. Price is the author of the book, Hip Hop Culture. He's the executive editor of the Encyclopedia of African American Music, and he's the editor of The Black Church and Hip Hop Culture Towards Bridging the Generational Divide. His website is emmettprice.com. And I'd like to welcome you, Emmett, my old friend. Thanks so much for being here. Hey, Ken, thank you so much for a kind introduction and the invitation to be here. You and Kevin are doing an amazing job. And thank the board of Jazz Boston for keeping the vision uh, that we've had, uh, you know, blazing. We need you more than ever now uh, as things change here in our beloved city of Boston. So thank you all for your leadership. I'm so excited to be with these three amazing let me do it this way. Amazing creatives, amazing educators, amazing influencers, amazing visionaries, just amazing people. And so I want to just set the stage for our conversation tonight, and then we will yield the floor to each of these three to hear from them. And then at the end of our evening, we'll come back together to have some, some Q&A, to really dialogue and and kind of engage in this conversation around spirituality and music and spirituality and jazz, gospel music, global music, however, creative improvisational music, however we want to define that. Definitions are essential. And in many ways, there is an interesting dialogue between what we know as spirituality and what we know as religion. And so today's conversation is about spirituality. Spirituality is a unique individual relationship with a human being and a energy, a creator, um, spirit, however that's defined, but it tends to be uniquely individual. Religion often is how we systematize that. 
so that we can have communication and dialogue and be inclusive in ways of bringing people together so that we can have a shared experience. So in many ways as creatives, we operate from a framework where we have muses, whether divine or, 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 or human or situational or experiential, but we also find that there's, there's some supernatural, some, I would use the word divine influence that comes from an energy and or a power that is much bigger than us as a human being. And in many ways we talk about that is spirituality. I'm just scratching the surface because we have these three very distinguished individuals who are gonna build on this conversation. For many years, I served as the, uh, one of the producers for the John Coltrane Memorial Concert here in, in the greater Boston area. And we would always talk about the fact that John Coltrane was a huge spiritual influence for a number of musicians. Matter of fact, his wife, his second wife, uh, beloved Alice John Coltrane, would often say that after his 1964 Love Supreme, that about 90% of all the music that he played was prayer. And that would include his practice. That would include him just, you know, exploring the music. And so that spiritual sensibility is something that is, is, is really unique at that level. And so we want to explore that a little bit too. So tonight, I want to bring up our first panelist. This young man has distinguished himself in so many ways in such a short time. I, I have watched him not only in high school over at Boston Arts Academy, uh, come through Berkeley College of Music, uh, just an exceptional scholar, musician, innovator, uh, you know, a composer, arranger, um, did a, a bachelor's degree and a master's degree, now is teaching at his alma mater, has his own quartet, uh, plays with the Charles Overton group. He is everywhere here in Boston. He is one of the young lions of, of this creative improvisatorial music and one of the great folks who will ex extremely expand his legacy, not only here in Boston, but across the planet. Gregory Groover Jr., come on, man, talk to us. Teach us, teach us tonight. Well, first of all, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Price. I mean, I can't thank you enough for that introduction and, and for making this happen. And also wanna thank uh, Ken Fields and, and uh, Kevin Harris, whom you know, I love dearly and, and appreciate uh, you know, your mentorship and for making this happen uh, for today and for everything that the work that you're doing with Jazz Boston. And I'm glad that we're, you know, I told uh, Mr. Price before we got here, Reverend Price to say that I'm excited that we're getting a chance to connect um, as well. Um, I, I do want to just quickly ask before I start speaking, um, can everyone hear me very well? And I only ask because I got the notification right before in the introduction it said your internet is unstable and i said oh of course this is how it works right okay so i'm getting thumbs up so i'm saying i'm gonna keep going if it, if it stops working for any reason uh kev i'm gonna improvise a little bit if you could just call me immediately that way i could like if, if for whatever reason you can't hear me just like or shoot me a text because oftentimes as we all know with zoom i'll be talking and you guys were long gone and i will have no idea and i could just side off and side back in uh, but so first, like I said, thank you all again um, for this, and and I, I'm I'm really excited to be here, honored to be here, um, especially with musicians that I respect so much, Miss um, Prescott, and then also uh, Ron Ron Mokti as well, and you know I admire both of you all as your musicianship and what you bring to not only here in Boston music scene but abroad and all the teaching and everything that you all do in making this music stay alive. So I'm really excited to be in the number with you all. Um, and I do have a short presentation. I know that we are um, somewhat pressed for time, so I do want to make sure that I um, push along. So I'm just going to share my screen. And uh, while I do that, also share audio. And get right into the presentation. So. Um, what I'm going to talk about, I'm going to jump around a little bit today. Um, I was tasked with the, um, um, with in some ways, it's almost impossible to really talk about the, you know, gospel music and all that it really encompasses um, and how it's influenced jazz in such a short time because there's so many um, aspects of this really rich music and tradition um, that, uh, you know, I'd be remiss if I thought I can do it in 15 to 20 minutes. I'm going to do my best. But I, I'm going to um, focus on a few key aspects and, and talk about that dialogue. Uh, but 
the, the main thing at first, I just want to start off with how I got interested in this music um, and, and where this all comes from. So, I, you know, I'm, I'm a local Boston musician. I grew up here. This is my home. Um, I'm proud to be from Boston, proud to be from Roxbury. And um, I had, I, I count it really as a privilege and a uh, blessing that to grow up um, hearing music every Sunday morning at the historic Charles Street Amy Church, um, where my, my father is the pastor who I believe is here. And then my mom is also a minister and I, I believe we have some Charles Street members. So I, I, I love you all and say hello to you all. Um, but that was something that was a part of my, my every Sunday experience and my weekly experience in music and hearing that. So that it wasn't foreign to me in that way, but it wasn't until later on in life when I got to Berkeley and, um, and started exploring how these forms correlated, right? Um, it was just a part of my everyday experience. I, I digested the music. I, I knew about hymns. I knew about spirituals, but I wasn't really sure um, where the line would cross and how we can delve in and the, the deep connection of jazz um, and what that is. Even when I started uh, listening to great musicians like John Coltrane, um, maybe I was hip to it and I could hear that there was something deeper going on. And later on, when I found out that he was the grandson of two Amy Zion ministers, I, I, I made some connections, but I didn't really, I still even then, I looked at it as the music I played on Sundays and then the music that I would play on Saturday evenings at like Wally's or for example, and I, and I separated the two, even though I knew that there were so many things that both um, genres did correlate and did connect with. Um, so before I talk too much more, I'm going to give myself a break because I know I will ramble. And I'm going to start off with just some music. And uh, Kevin, I know you'll appreciate this and any jazz fan will appreciate this. Um, uh, this artist, this great pioneer of the music, uh, Thelonious Monk. Um, and, and, and Kevin, the reason why I shout you out is because actually you shared this with me. I, I wasn't hit to this particular rendition. Uh, this is Thelonious Monk performing uh, a, a, a gospel hymn that we're, many of us are familiar with. Uh, it's a tune that I won't give you the title now because I'll see if anybody put it in the chat, maybe if you pick it up. And I believe that he also mentions it in the intro, but I'm just going to start there and then I'll uh, do some talking and continue on. So here's Thelonious Monk. Ich möchte Thelonious Monk jetzt fragen, welches sein Lieblingsstück ist. Und ich glaube, wir werden da eine überraschende Antwort bekommen. What would you say, Thelonious, is your favorite tune or one of your favorite tunes? Well, it's a favorite hymn that I like a lot. Uh, we recorded it for a Prince picture, by and by when the morning comes. Thelonious Monk nennt es eine Hymne. Es ist ein choralartiges Stück aus dem vergangenen Jahrhundert. Er hat es aufgenommen für einen französischen Film, By and By When the Morning Comes. And so I almost feel like we should applause just for Monk and his artistry. Um, and what, what I think is so beautiful about that is that obviously for those who, who are familiar with that hymn, um, it's recognizable. He's playing the melody, he states it very clearly. Uh, you can hear the chorus, you can hear the verse. Everything is good to go, right? He, he could play that in the church and everyone would be understanding, all the mothers of the church would understand it. We'd be good to go there. Uh, but for those who don't know that piece, you hear Thelonious Monk before you hear anything else, um, which proves that this music was so embedded in him, um, both from a cultural aspect, but also just from uh, a harmonic sense. He was, you know, obviously here's some stride piano there, um, uh, which is, he's a great son of that music. Um, but, you know, a lot of people don't know that Monk spent some time, um, despite what his beliefs may have been later on, he spent some time for, I believe, two or three years traveling with an evangelist. 
um, all around the Midwest, all in the South, and, and playing some organ and some piano and backing them up. So he had that experience and that was embedded in his music at the very early age of 17. So what we know as Thelonious Monk's music also happens to be gospel music in the Black American tradition of church, um, which I'll talk about right now. Uh, but before I do that, actually, uh, just because I know we are pressed for time, I just want to give some really, really obvious, and which may be obvious, I never want to assume, uh, maybe obvious connections uh, in the way that gospel music relates to jazz. So obviously it's community driven music. Um, it's important that we have each other. This music doesn't happen at its, in its purest, most beautiful renditions and silos. Although, however, we do just acknowledge that we just heard a beautiful solo piano rendition of um, By and By. Uh, but this is something that's community-based driven music. Monk performed with the quartet, right? He also performed in the big band setting. Um, and he, he um, and much like other jazz musicians, it was a social aspect to this music that is related in both gospel music and also in jazz. Uh, you also have um, similar harmonic devices. Now I'm not gonna get into the, uh, talking too much about that, but two five ones, altered chords, um, sub fives, all that stuff, all the language that musicians we all love that we acknowledge and, and everyone else just loves hearing, right? You have the use of call and response. Uh, this can be done in many different ways. You have uh, maybe you're in a big band and you know the lead player is playing a phrase and then the rest of the band plays it right back. Or in congregational music and a lot of um, traditional gospel congregations, you have someone, a deacon of the church or someone who will sing a song and start a phrase and you will repeat that same thing, right? Um, and with that comes improvisation. Um, once we've performed the song a few times in the church and we're, we've already serviced the message, now we can start to alter that message and we can improvise a little bit in our phrasing or in the words we use. Maybe we can, we're talking about faith, but maybe we're showing different aspects of it by the words that we choose to, to use or different stories that we quote from the Bible. That happens in jazz as well. Um, then the use of vamps. Um, we hear it all the time. It's, it's a big thing in jazz music and always has been, um, but also in gospel music as well. As we want to hit home a point, we hit home the point and hit home the point and hit home the point by vamping over and over and over again to make sure that they're really understanding the message of what we're trying to convey. And then last but certainly not least, because there are others, but these are the main ones, um, the use of emotions. Uh, you can't listen to Art Blakey's music and not hear joy and celebration, but then also pain, sorrow, and hope, right? All these things can go coexist in both gospel music, you hear it, right? We're, we're, we're delivering a message. We're trying to encourage people to get through their pain and their sorrows um, and to celebrate, um, celebrating the gospel, but that, that while also acknowledging that these things exist, right? It was Art Blakey that says jazz, wipes away the dust of everyday life, right? That same thing happens in gospel music and that's why people fellowship in the church. And I thought that it would yeah, be remiss if I didn't speak a lot about that, the importance of it, because the gospel music in itself doesn't happen without the black church, right? So the experience of the, the traditional black church, at, at least, um, is, can be broken into three main components. You have the preach word, which is the pinnacle of the service. Uh, much like, you know, obviously we, you know, in jazz music, we're dealing with improvised music. You do play the melody in the same way that a preach word, you're quoting scriptures, you're coming from the book of Luke or wherever, right? You're playing my favorite things in the way that Coltrane would have done. But then the pinnacle is really where he speaks and decides to improvise or, or, or quotes things from his past or other musical things that he's he's hip to or familiar with. And that's the same thing as the preach word, right? So that's the pinnacle of the service. That's where people should, in their best intention, should be coming to church for, right? It's the same thing in, 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 in uh, jazz music. Um, the other thing, as I mentioned earlier, is sense of community. Uh, Black Americans, um, as like many oppressed people, but particularly dealing with in America, um, the sense of having a, a place where you can go, we have folks who look like you, sound like you are dealing with the same struggles as you and can help encourage you along the way and to be able to um, serve um, in many different ways, serve your community, serve each other, build each other up. Um, these are things that are, are experiences that aren't necessarily uh, explicitly exclusive to the black church, but is highlighted there and it's a main component. And then finally, um, a really important one is the black liturgical music. 
Uh, and that consists of gospel music, which at times we, we like to lump in and lump all of them in um, under that umbrella, but it's a style of black liturgical music. You have gospel music, which literally just means the good news. You have hymns, anthems, congregational songs, where a lot of these call and response um, will happen. And then finally, spirituals. Uh, and this is something that's near and dear to my heart because um, I released some music a couple years ago as a part of my, um, my thesis project, my master's program, which is when I started to make this cor correlation for myself of the, the rich history of spiritual music and jazz music and how those two things are com uh, combined. Uh, you can listen to John Coltrane's music. He actually has a song called Spiritual. You hear that. Uh, you hear in his writing um, the, the, the use of modal um, elements and melodies and short pentatonic phrases um, that are all things that are, live heavily in both um, spirituals and jazz music, particularly Coltrane's music. Um, and spirituals in particular, uh, you can break these down into two categories. Uh, the first one being message songs. Um, and these are, and it's beautiful this, you can look at spirituals, it's also seen in hip hop, uh, the certain coding and duality that happens in spiritual music and jazz as well, where you have the surface level of what the music is conveying. It could be like, for example, my funny, um, uh, my funny, uh, my favorite things rather with Coltrane, where we, we know it's a show tune, we know where it comes from, but he's conveying a very different message on that soprano saxophone, which is clear right away. The same things happen in spiritual music and then also in hip hop music later on and obviously in jazz, uh, where, where we have a tune like Wade in the Water um, or Fall the Drinking Gourd, which is telling a message to slaves how they can march to freedom, right? Um, there's a liturgical element and there's a spiritual element where they are quoting scripture and it is Bible based, uh, but it also sends another message. The same thing happens whenever Art Blakey plays his drums or whenever Coltrane plays his horn or any other musician, um, there's a spiritual component there that, that lives in the addition to the foot tapping feel good music. And then you also have the songs of hope. Uh, and these songs of hope um, are songs that help oppress people and, and, and folks who need the encouragement, uh, gives them that space of, to not only think about how they will get over or how they got over, um, but also acknowledging their newfound religion and their faith that they do have. So it seems like done made my vow to the Lord. Um, my soul has been anchored in the Lord or give me Jesus. These are songs of hope that would encourage people. We also see that in jazz as well. Um, one of the beautiful things, and this is why I love thinking and in, in, in connecting in jazz and spiritual music, is that there's, this, as I said, a beautiful sense of duality that happens. Um, and, and sometimes the trilogy of these three, uh, sometimes that are happening all at the same time. Because like I said, you do have the biblical element uh, that's happening. So they're telling the good news of the Bible, right, the gospel. Um, but then they're also getting messages that, um, you know, folks from outside of the community might not be hip to or may not be privy to, right? Because that's how they continue to, um, to, to uh, uh, provide a comfortable space and safety to each other, right? With tunes like Wade in the Water um, or Fall the Drinking Board. Um, but then you also have this element of where the spirituality meets with um, duality of messaging. So in a tune like Rock in Jerusalem, they're quoting um, biblical characters like Mary and Martha, who we're familiar with. Uh, but when they're talking about Rock in Jerusalem, they're talking about Nat Turner coming into Virginia um, and freeing slaves. And Nat Turner being someone that they often, slaves often correlated um, to as Jesus Christ, right? So when they're singing about Jesus Christ, they are acknowledging and singing and telling the good news of the Bible, but they're also acknowledging that among them, there is someone that they are also acknowledging as their savior as well. So you have these multi-layered things that happen in this music that also happen in jazz, right? Um, you, and you can look at it from an instrumental perspective where you have your bass, which is providing a root, right? That could be the faith, right? Then you have the drums and that's the rhythm, that's connection, that's, that's a layer right there. Then you have a harmonic bass and then a horn player or a vocalist that's providing the message as well. So there are plenty of ways that you can start to look and and, and connect uh, jazz and spirituals music. Um, and that's something that I, I, I believe that all musicians who've had the chance to be in the black uh, uh, church and experience gospel had that. Um, you know, Wayne Shorter, for example, I think of him, you know, he grew up hearing uh, Sarah Vaughn sing in church, 
right? So wherever he ended up and whatever he ended up believing later on in life and performing, that's always going to be with him. That duality is always going to be there. Thelonious Monk, we heard his rendition of By and By earlier. That's always going to be there. Coltrane, as I told the story about uh, his two grandfathers that were Amy Zion ministers, that's always going to be there as he explored other areas of spirituality as well. Um, and that's why this music has been so important to me and been something that I want to study. Um, and that not only it's been my childhood, part of my childhood, but it's been something that continues to teach me something new every day. Um, and with that, I do want to just quickly play um, uh, a rendition. First, um, the first thing you'll hear is Paul Robinson uh, performing Go Down Moses. Um, and then the second thing you'll hear is actually a rendition that I put together based on um, hearing this song and other versions of Go Down Moses. And this will actually, this is a bit of a sneak preview as this is something that hasn't been released yet. Um, hopefully it will be released next month. Um, this is the, uh, the second part of the Negro Spiritual Songbook. And this is uh, my rendition of Go Down Moses. So first you'll hear Paul Robinson, and then you'll hear um, myself, Jason Palmer, Clay Nordhill on guitar, Jesse Tate on piano, Max Ridley on bass, and then Jared Stoker on drums. So here's Paul Robinson. Hopefully enjoyed that, and hopefully uh, you'll you'll support and check out the music at when it release. I'll give more information on that as we go along. But once again, I just want to highlight you know the use of pentatonic melodies, minor tonalities that that is featured in the original version, and then also in jazz music. It's a lot of the same melody choices, some of the same harmonic choices that you know that you hear as well. Um, that you know that can be expanded upon. And, and really um, explored, which is one of the beautiful things about the spiritual music, given that um, it does in many ways has a simple, at least on paper melodies, it gives a lot of uh, uh, space for arrangers or whoever to come in and do a lot of work around it, which is what I tried to do on my arrangement. Um, and then I just wanna just finish off with just no noting um, some other great musicians who are doing some phenomenal work or have done phenomenal work um, through gospel and spirituals. Um, obviously, you know, one of the fathers of this music, jazz music, uh, Duke Ellington, he has a concert of sacred music uh, where he, he does a re rendition of the Lord's Prayer composition that he had done, as well as Come Sunday, his original. Um, then you have an unusual suspect in terms of his kind of notoriety in jazz, a uh, great tenor saxophone uh, player, Gene Ammons, uh, who releases a record preaching, right? So I don't know the story of Gene Ammons uh, in terms of his childhood, I only know the, the, the passings that I've heard about him as a person, you know, as a musician and kind of a colorful uh, human he was. And they, I'll say, put it this way, not someone that we necessarily expected to come out with an album called Preaching. Uh, but once again, it's clear that 
you can't disassociate um, the black church experience from the musician as we all many musicians that we know and love grew up playing in church and still do that today playing church on Sundays, but you're also performing and using your gift in various other places. So he on preaching um, uh, does blessed assurance and precious memories. Uh, Nat Adley, great a cornet player who um, on one of my favorite records saying something which features uh, Joe Henderson on saxophone. He does Walls of Jericho. Uh, James Williams, who is, uh, you know, we, we claim him as Boston, although I never got a chance to meet him. Um, I know how, how deeply impactful he was on this community and so many musicians um, who've come through here. Um, uh, one of my mentors, including uh, Bill, Bill Pierce, um, this recording that he did with his band ICU, um, that we've got what you need, they do the spiritual Calvary. And then you've got Eric Reed, a, a great pianist, um, who is a disciple of Monk, but also grew up listening to gospel music, playing in the church, um, heavily influenced by the Hawkins family. Uh, he's got a great recording where he does Wade in the Water, uh, you've got Rodney Whitaker and Carl Allen, who has a great record um, called Work to Do, where they do Speak to My Heart by Donnie McClurkin. Uh, then obviously the, the big one that has a lot of notoriety, uh, Kirk Whalum, who did the gospel according to jazz. And uh, last but not least, a great saxophonist who's inspired me, uh, Mr. Jimmy Green, uh, who also spent some time, used to come up and play Wallace, from what I understand, on a weekly basis, uh, along with trumpet player Darren Barrett. He has a record called Mission State. Um, that was really, if I trace it back, that was the first time I heard someone arrange a gospel song, give thanks in that way, where it was like, it was like no holds barred. I'm putting in all my, you know, meter changes, all of my chord changes, everything that I love. And that represents a modern jazz and throwing that in there as well. It wasn't just, I'm playing the melody, putting the swing, swing beat on it, which is cool too. Um, but he really stretched it out on that arrangement. Um, and I, I discovered that, um, as I was graduating high school, actually. Um, so that those are some really great artists that I that I love and admire, and I just want to share it with you. And there are plenty more, so um, I'd love to keep talking, keep the conversation going. Um, and yeah, thank you again, Ken and, and Kevin and, and Emmett, and, and obviously um, Ron and, and Ms. Prescott, I'm excited to hear from you all. And I just appreciate really being here and giving an opportunity to share a little bit about my experience with spirituals, gospel music, and jazz. Awesome, 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 awesome. What an awesome presentation. Thank you so much for sharing. And, and not only just sharing from your head, but also sharing from your heart and sharing from your experience and your expertise. Our young people over at BAA are in good hands uh, with you over there as an educator. I'm so grateful uh, to you for all that you shared. And thank you so much for sharing your music. Uh, I can't wait. We can't wait until it hits so that we can get it. And by get it, I mean purchase it to support our musicians so that we can keep music live. That was just absolutely amazing. I have so many questions, but I want to move on to the program. And we have just a phenomenal person coming next. When I think about Nadelka, I think about energy. a long time. She has had a number of projects. Uh, one was Manifest in 2008. Another one was The Light in 2018. Another is the Unsilenced Voice 2020. She has performed all over the place. She is a professor at Berklee College of Music at New England Conservatory of Music. She has her own voice studio in Brooklyn, New York. She is everywhere doing a lot, even at Yale, even at the Andover Newton Seminary at Yale. Uh, divinity school there um, always learning always growing always sharing always inspiring always encouraging always motivating and always teach us come on sister teach us tonight you are up <laughs> oh my gosh um thank you dr price you know i'm going to ask you to stay with me because as much as i teach 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 i want to have a conversation today i'm with you um thank you to kevin thank you to ken for your invitation it is absolutely my absolutely my honor and my blessing and then to sit here with the reverend dr groover jr 
<laughs> um, come on up, uh, train up a child in a way you can even help yourself. Um, and to my brother, Ron Madi, thank you so much. Dr. Price Emmett, um, just to, you know, just a little bit on my background in terms of I'm, I'm just a girl from Brooklyn, um, like you said, whose family was born in Panama. And my father was a classical musician. He was with us until August of two nine, uh, 2019. Um, and I was raised in the Anglican church. Um, and as an Afro-Latina sister raised in the, the Anglican church, um, I have to be quite honest about my move into improvisation was difficult. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that also comes with a spiritual journey. Um, you know, if it wasn't on the printed paper, because that was my training, was it, the notes are right there. If it wasn't there, I was, you know, a little bit confused. And then also the culture that I come from, you just kind of read, you know, we read our prayers in the Episcopal church. Everything is written out for you. You don't have to think <laughs> about it. Uh, there's no improvisation there. And so it's been a journey for me. Um, and as much as when I got into college, um, this was the first time I was liberated, this is undergrad, liberated from the music that I was doing, which was the music under my father's baton of classical music. Did a lot of oratorios, was being groomed to be a mezzo-soprano, a contralto uh, soloist. Um, but then I found Ella Fitzgerald. Mm. Um, and for my entire undergraduate, it was either her alone or her with Louis Armstrong. Mm -hmm. um, and so there was no formal jazz training for me. It was really just listening to her and just using the musical language that I had from my classical background, just perceiving Ella Fitzgerald in that way. But when I started to try to, to improvise, um, and, and I have to also connect this to me, who is now a seminarian, me, the, the Christian uh, sister, um, I have always been drawn to gospel music. And I put gospel and jazz in the same way as, as young, Groover Jr. was saying, we know so many musicians who play by night and play by day in the church. Um, and it, so it was just a wonder for me just listening to gospel music. But I noticed that something was a little bit different from for me being someone that's coming from a Spanish speaking culture and background with a West Indian culture behind it. And so I noticed it took me such a long time to realize that my my pocket my groove mm -hmm. was a little bit different. Um, and the way that I was engaging with gospel music always felt different. Um, and it took me a while to embrace how I do it. How did, how did you translate, right? So how did you translate? Because you have this robust education in terms of the yeah. classical pedigree, uh, which we don't, we don't want to poo-poo on it. Right. But once, once you know how to use it in a different way, now it frees you up because you have a lingua franca that is so expansive. So, so how did you make that transition to be free in what was formerly kind of constricting? I have to honestly say, I think things like that come with a breakdown first. Yes, let's be honest about it. Let's be you honest know, about it. Um, I am someone who, um, and I'm, I put it on the table because I wanna speak to those folks out there who have ever dealt with depression and anxiety, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which I did for like 30 plus years. But I think that's something that, um, I, I don't denounce medication or like mm -hmm. Western forms of healing, but for me, um, I attach those things to spirit. When you're bound and when you're not truly being yourself, I think it's hard for someone who's sensitive and creative to, creative to live in this world mm -hmm. um, and be sane. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if especially if you're like not the conforming type. So for me, literally a lot of things had to break down. Mm -hmm. You know, I had to look at God for myself. I had to understand God for myself. And so one of the things I talk about, even for me, the first time that I felt what we call the Holy Spirit was actually in Prospect Park. And I am someone who was raised in church. I was born on a Thursday. My mother left the hospital with me on a Sunday. And the first place we went was to church. Wow. It was for me to be christened. And so I was raised in church. But like with all things, you know, you have to find God for yourself. I can't do my mama or my grandmother's religion. Um, and so the first time I experienced that kind of fluid spirit um, release in the spirit was literally in Prospect Park in a drama circle. Wow. Um, where we go every Sunday from Easter to Thanksgiving. I haven't been there recently because I've been like more um, in New England, but you could go there and you'd hear the African drumming and people are just coming from everywhere with drums, with, with metal uh, to keep the bell sound going. And it was in that space that I started to understand um, my spirituality, my freedom for myself. That being said, 
I also found myself deeply attracted to the one who was mentioned before Thelonious Monk. Mm -hmm. oh, he was just so weird, mm -hmm. you know, and that's the language that I had for him at the time. He was just different from like all the other looks that I was seeing. And it just seemed that he was a very honest person who was not maybe understood so well in his time. Um, but I remember, and I had the opportunity to speak with Randy Weston and, mm -hmm. and meet him for myself. Um, but I remember watching this specific uh, uh, interview of him and they said he would just be silent. You know, Randy Weston said he would go to his house and Thelonious Monk would play for hours and not speak. And then he would, well, not speak with words. Yeah, there you go. And he would play there for hours and stop. And Randy Weston would look at him like, oh, I guess that's it. There was no conversation, but he was expressing a lot. And so that kind of personal personalization of one's relationship with music mm -hmm. for me was necessary because I needed to see someone who was doing it their own way, who was not um, conforming to the noise that's outside, who had to figure it out for themselves. Um, and as much as we think that Thelonious Monk is radical, just even in this one conversation, he's now being mentioned for the second time um, for his honesty and his integrity with in the, excuse me, within the music. Um, Let me ask you this question, and because yeah. I, I want you to cue up something. I know you have something to share for us, but I want to ask you this question because that that beautiful piece that 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 uh, Brother Groover played, um, the way that it came out and the way we experienced it allowed us to experience the loneliest monk channeling something to the audience that was spiritual, even if it may not have been religious. And I, and I say it this way, it's religious source material, but the Lonely's Monk himself rebuked any connection to organized religion. And yet he was able to channel something that was so deeply spiritual. And, and when I listen to your music, when I experience your, um, your creative expression, uh, uh, both, and I, I've had a chance to back you uh, maybe once or twice years ago, but, but but when when I you bring out an energy that is so profoundly Nadelka mm -hmm. that that it's like whoa, right? So can, you, can maybe you could play something and talk about what what it is, or maybe help us to understand what you're channel, how you're channeling, and 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 how do you experience that? So I was gonna I was gonna show something else, but this this is good. Thank you for that because I was gonna bring up a rendition of "Lift Every Voice" and sing that I did with a young man that I work with named Franz Robert. Mm. But I think what would probably define my experience a little bit more is a song called "The Light" that I wrote, um, originally called "The Path," and it talked about these decisions that I had to make. Um, you know, someone who's, you know, it's hard being a Christian. Um, it's hard being a Christian in the streets and it's hard being a Christian in the house. Um, and especially when, like, I'm a questioner, I, I question mm -hmm. everything. Um, mm -hmm. God gets questioned, but I think God wants us to do that. And so there came a point when I had to believe in God again, that same, that same narrative of believing in God for myself, you know, um, and being raised to believe that women should do a certain thing and it should be done a certain way. There's a whole conversation that I have in terms of the unsilenced voice. And I see Madison has been talking about women. Um, I think one of the things I try not to, to make an, uh, a big deal about because I don't want to make it seem like being a woman is a burden for me because it absolutely is not. But one of the things that my father told me that pissed me off thoroughly was he said to me in his Afro-Latino way that a woman cannot do what a man does. Um, and he told me that, and I think he was trying to prepare me and, and get me right for what this world would be. But all that did was make me more defiant because I am in fact his daughter. Um, but I, I think for me with the light, I had to really just negotiate a lot of things on my own that in, in, in the context of being in, in a, in a religion, um, you know, it kind of limits your mind and it kind of tells you what you, again, what you should and should not do. And I was like, I don't think, I don't think that's what God is. You know, I think God allows me to do a little bit more. I think God is more gracious. Um, I think God has a way bigger sense of humor. I, I think, um, there are larger issues in this world that need to be addressed. I do believe that personal discipline is a thing when it comes to our spiritual spirituality and our walk, but I don't think God micromanages in the way that us humans do it. Mm 
Um, and I definitely don't think that God is judgmental in the way that we do. And all of that was literally affecting me even making that transition from singing classical into gospel. Cause I felt like, you know, I was taught like, you know, as a vocalist, um, and, and let's be mindful that the way that gospel singers sing years ago, that's right. Is different from the way the gospel artists are singing now. That's right. And so for someone like me who gets into Ella Fitzgerald, when I heard Kim Burrell, I was like, yes, <laughs> all of it. Or, you know, even when I listen to, and they're not necessarily religious, but I know she's spiritual, Rachel Farrell. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Or just mm -hmm. even keen on, on Ella Fitzgerald. And it took me until yesterday ago to finally understand Billie Holiday in a way that I couldn't before. Mm. Um, her sound was so radical to me and it was so the opposite of classical music. It was just so wavy and all over the place that I was just like, where are you? Until I understood what freedom meant mm. um, and, and her specific freedom as it dealt with trauma, which also relates to the thing that I'm saying about being a woman in this world. You know, we have to show up and there's all this trauma behind it and the way we express it gets questioned. You know, and so for me, I myself was even questioning Billie Holiday because she didn't sound like the other women. But mm -hmm. when I looked at her story, you know, she's been through some things. And so it's going to show up in the way this, uh, that she sings it. And for me, um, and I appreciate all the, 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 the warmth that you are sharing with me in terms of my art because it's been a journey, but that's what's showing up. You know, yeah. all the things that I've been through, yeah. all the times that I've had to get up again after I fell down again, you yeah. know, um, the fact that I solo parented the entire time when I was in Boston on little money working in three different schools with no car, <laughs> you know, like this is real stuff. And these aren't things you complain about because just like my mother, you just get up and you do it. You do um, it. That's right. You know, so yeah, that's my mm. response to that. Mm. So I'm actually going to pull up the light. Um, just give me a quick second. Is there a question you can ask me so that we're not lagging? I, I, I'm not going to ask you a question and we're not lagging. But you okay. are blessing us with your honesty and transparency. So I will say thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> it should take me just a little bit. So this song is called The Light. Um, and it's talking about my spiritual journey and about the, the choices that I've had to make. I'm just going to share the audio. Sure. Okay. And this song also I wrote as a homework assignment, originally by the name of the path, I wrote as a homework assignment in uh, Hankus Netsky's, Netsky's class in New England Conservatory, of which I am a graduate class of 2012. Um, and on it, on drums, uh, ooh, let me look, because I'm putting myself on the spot. So let's start with Overdubbing by Rob Flax, Farai Malik and Sam Jones on back and vocals, Tim Smith, who graduated from Berkeley on organ, Ida Klein, who also graduated from Berkeley, who is um, born in Israel and, and right now lamenting what's happening in, happening in his country. So I send shout outs to him on electric guitar, Christian Crawford, who is um, a phenom on bass, also a Berkeley graduate. And of course, Jarrell Campbell, also Berkeley graduate on drums and Alex Yen, uh, who contributed. So I'm going to play that now. Please tell me if you hear it. Um. Storm 
I say, I say, I mean, that was powerful. I, let me call an audible real quick. Uh, Kevin or Ken, can you bring Brother Ron McBee in here with me and Sister the Duck? I just want to add uh, in him in here. Sister the Duck, I want to, I want to have you comment on this as we're bringing Ron in and I will introduce him shortly. Yeah. What has been created from your deep pain? Yeah is bringing me such healing right now. Mm. And, and, and for the power of, of the spiritual transference. See, this is what I'm talking about, about particularly with you and energy from, from, from your healing energy. Yeah. You, you have blessed us 
with a catalyst for our own healing. Understanding that our traumas are going to be different than your traumas. Our right. experiences are going to be different than our experience. But, but what, what, what you put on that music and what you put in that message transfers across nationality, transfers across gender, trans, transfers across ethnicity, trans, transfers across culture, transfers across religion. Right. Because there's a power this. I want you to ref- just 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 a quick knee jerk reaction to that. And then I'm I'm a respond. I'm a, I'm a introduce brother Ron and we're going to add him to this conversation. Yeah. Um, I appreciate that because then you made me feel in your words that I've been successful because that's the intention um, that when we heal, then we are to heal. Yes. Um, and I think that's the whole point about spiritual spirituality in jazz is um, it's supposed to transcend. It's supposed to get to the heart of the matter and bring the necessary change. Even though in this particular song, you hear my Afro-Latina roots, um, yeah a little bit of gospel and me, the folk singer, all rolled in one. Um, And if it can bring healing, then that's what it's about. Mm. That's all it's about. Powerful, powerful. Joining us right now is, is I I would say, one of the baddest brothers on the planet. Um, Bad in a good way, of course. Um, One of the most genuine brothers on the planet. And, And in my own articulation, one of the most beautiful brothers on the planet. And, and, and I will say that, um, because I have watched Ron play just about with everybody. Um, matter of fact, I've been blessed to be able to play with him in, in some of the schools across Boston. We've gone in with the old John Coltrane uh, educational outreach program. And there's just such a gift and there's such a giving in Ron's playing. It's not just notes. It's not just notes. It's not just music. It's, it's something else. And Ron, I want you to talk about your how, how you would articulate what you do and what you give through this artistic expressive form. Thank you all for inviting me. Um, it's my pleasure to be here with the other esteemed guests, uh, all of whom I appreciate so much. Um, Adelka is my office partner at Berkeley. Uh, we've had some serious conversations <laughs> my brother Kevin, um, with some of his music and through working with uh, Jason Palmer on the the Mothers Project, that uh, that's some of the most touchy music uh, that I've ever played. And, you know, I have a new appreciation for it now. And then Mr. Mr. Gregory Groover. Boy, you sound so much like your father. It ain't ain't funny. (laughs) (laughs) I used to see you, man, coming carrying your horn, you know, in the snow and everything, you know, when you first came to Berkeley. And then slowly but surely I started seeing you separate yourself from the, the they say the cream rises to the top. I started seeing that. And, I, and then in some of your students, you know, just, I was like, you know what? He is the guy. He is definitely the person because of what you're doing and, you know, with your horn and your music and the ability to, to uh, transform that, or to the students, and they see that, and that's that's a wonderful gift. So I just want to say thank you uh, to all of you. Um, I see my brother Eric Jackson, uh, Salam, mm-hmm. my brother. Mm-hmm. Uh, but and then for you, brother Emmett, yeah, it's been. I mean, my journey has been. Um, I grew up in the Pentecostal church, what we call the, uh, some of the older folks called the Holy Rollers, but it was a Kojic church, mm-hmm. and so in my church we. Uh, uh, we got down. I mean, in the sense of we had organ and piano, and they always said that uh, they kept saying jazz was the devil's music. But the the organs we had this brother Reverend Hickman, he would take it right to the doorstep of jazz, and then he just kind of back away from it because he knew he didn't want to cross that threshold. <laughs> but that was some of my first. I mean, training or just listening to music. Um, playing the, the snare drum, you know, especially when they get the shouting. And um, first I'd be on the one and three, then I'd switch it up on the two and the four on them, you know. And they, you know, learn how to play the tambourine in the church, you know, things like that. At uh, points later, I might have played guitar. But, you know, that was uh, a big part of my my upbringing. Um, and, you know, my mother sang in the church. My father, he didn't necessarily go to church, but he played guitar, you know, after work, uh, him and his some of his buddies, you know, 
they get maybe a half a cup of some home brewing and, and mm-hmm. it's all about the Mississippi blues, you know, um, foot stomping, you know, blue, I mean, that's, that was my first introduction to blues and things of that nature, but he had a nice record collection of, um, uh, Diz, Swing Low, Sweet Cat, like, you know, mm-hmm. West Montgomery with Jimmy Smith, Kenny Burrell. I mean, he, he, that was sort of my, I mean, just the stuff that he had, I would listen to that, you know, along with some uh, Red Fox records, too, to be, just, to be honest. <laughs> just so you know. <laughs> that's, that's, the, that's the other jazz. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so that was the, that was sort of, you know, then when I came to, to I mean, I, I, I didn't really play with any bands in my hometown of Wisconsin, uh, Racine, Wisconsin, but there was one group that, I mean, we were sort of uh, doing like some jazz rock kind of stuff, but then when I came to Boston, to Berkeley, um, I mean, at that time I was just playing electric bass, and I always wanted to play upright, uh, that was the sound in my head, and uh, my teacher was uh, was John Nabs, and then all my mm-hmm. boys when I got here were either from Philly or Jersey, and so it's like, that was a whole new education, you know, because they were... Um, they knew so much more about Islam. I mean, I was, I mean, I was trying to, I was searching, and but these mm-hmm. guys were like, "Man, why you put that in your body?" You know, they weren't practicing Muslims or anything like that, but they knew so much about how to better yourself as a person. Mm-hmm. You know, and so that that was a big influence on me. You know. Um, I mean, alongside of them knowing about all of that, they knew how to run game too, you know, so it was, it was crazy. <laughs> it was, some, you know, it was just flip mode all the time, you know, but it was, it was a great education for me. And, you know, the things that we, we dealt with, um, there were about 10 of us who were, um, were interested in Islam. And, you know, we used to go to the masjid, um, in, on Interville street. Mm-hmm. Um, then the other side of that, we were, um, walk down Boston Street, 10 of us wearing kufis, you know, prayer caps, and it's like scaring people half to death, you know, because we were young and crazy. Um, but, you know, um, and then there was another guy around who who's no longer here, um, Billy Skinner. He was oh, you know, man. trying to help us, you know, teach us a little bit about jazz and stuff. Um, so, you know, my head, I mean, just the different types of music that folks were bringing to the table kind of influenced me, and um, there was... Uh, I ran into this, this, there was a drummer here from Canada, Nasir Abdul Khalik, I think it was his name. His father was a tenor player. And uh, he would, he, he mentioned to me about, you know, Coltrane and, you know, how Love Supreme came about. And because he was hanging with John Coltrane, and he was telling me, you know, at that time that um, the record company uh, execs and I guess maybe the world wasn't really ready for mm-hmm. for train uh, what he was trying to say because you know he was on a on a mission uh, he was trying to he was trying to find peace man yes and, yeah. and, and he told me that you know train originally when he he um, started with that that whole concept it wasn't a love supreme it was a law supreme mm-hmm. but they weren't going to allow that so he had to change the title in order for it to, 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 you know, be published and all that kind of stuff, you mm-hmm. know, so, but when I look at the, the, um, I did a gig with, um, Leonard Brown and, uh, Sir Eric, Eric Jackson was mm-hmm. narrating the, the liner notes from A Love Supreme. That's like, and I started really, I mean, I had been listening to Train, um, because he, 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 he plays, uh, like he, he he's searching for this other side of things, mm-hmm. you know. I mean, he he yeah, he's a part of the, us earthly beings like Sun Ra, but he's like he's 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 out in space somewhere looking for this other kind of uh, existence, man. And so when when Eric was um, reciting the the um, the liner notes, I was like, man, it's like he took bits and pieces from. You know the Holy Quran, man, and, and and it was like this all makes sense. I mean, because you know, I've seen it before and I talked, mm-hmm. you know, I read it, but I never really, really listen. You know. Let me press in on this, Ron, because I I, I just if if you can I'm glad help, you did because I jump around a lot. No, that's fine. But I I I what would be the significance of it being Allah 
supreme. Can you can you can you extract that for those of us who may not be familiar with with that faith tradition and 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 that language? Well, that word Allah is just uh, the 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 Arabic name for God. I mean, even in in in, in uh, societies where Arabic is the dominant language, whether they're Christians or whatever, mm -hmm. that's the word that they use. You mm -hmm. know, um, and so for uh, that. Uh, I, I tend to say creator a lot of times when I, I'm, I'm expressing things so that um, I don't um, hopefully uh, be abrasive or, or rude or whatever. I, I want to respect all, you know, traditions, mm -hmm. you know, and so that I, I think when I say uh, the creator, I think I'm encompassing, you know, um, folks different uh, named for the, 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 the creator. So mm -hmm. you know, I, just, I just tend to go that route, you know, so yeah. Um, What's the other part of your question now? Well, Before just in terms of, I mean, because what you just said just leads me in a different direction. But but the notion of Allah Supreme, you know, is is not trying to suggest that Coltrane is, you know, narrowing the field. He's actually widening the field in, in the sense of, of, you know, belief and spirituality. Well, when you understand that, there is a, 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 a another being that is responsible for all of this um, our existence when you when you you start to contemplate I guess um, the cycle of life and death mm -hmm. and what goes on in between and how say some people live to a grand old age of whatever and then some others uh, are uh, life is cut short um, at a young age mm -hmm. and you know you you, you start understanding um, that it's it's um, no one is guaranteed uh, a long life and you know every day is a, is a blessing mm -hmm. and I, I think for, for 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 Coltrane he was I mean or just even people who are let me let me let me take it a bit first people who are so we say centered and who understand that there is a higher power mm -hmm. that at some point I, I do have to answer to. Um, there's something that I believe in that is sort of controlling this whole thing. Um, I'm, you know, it's something that, that people, I mean, and not even, uh, um, don't even think about religion per se, but think about, okay, what is the meaning of life? And yeah. how do you benefit from yeah. uh, having uh, a good life versus, say, a bad life? And who defines that? Yeah. How do you define that? Yeah. I mean, what brings you joy? Um, and for me, when I'm, I'm playing music, namely the bass, um, can I put a smile on someone's face uh, in something that I play? Can I um, help them to have a better existence? Mm -hmm while they're there listening to say what is being played or what has been recorded um does it help them to to have you know a, a much better just life i mean for me that you know they say music is the um it soothes the savage beast and all of us so it's it's a uh it's a healing it, mm -hmm. it can um for me music was um it was like uh I was, well, for lack of a better word, let me let me go ahead. And, and, and please don't take it out of context. But music is like a high, you know, mm -hmm. a legal high, mm -hmm. with no side effects. Mm -hmm. um, what could be better? And, and I don't mean to go, you know, on that side of things, but you know, when musicians are playing, or even when people are listening, mm -hmm. uh, I'm quite sure folks will tell you, I've been transformed. I mean, I I went to Hawaii and back while you when you all were playing that song or i've been to whatever exotic place or where not maybe not it's so exotic but you made me forget that i broke up my girlfriend my boyfriend maybe mm -hmm. my, my car was repossessed uh, uh you made me forget all of those tragic or bad things that may have happened to me in the past whatever um uh, when i would listen to your, your your music you know mm -hmm. and that's the the healing the transformative powers of of music and I mean, and it's, again, I'm not, uh, I don't necessarily agree with all music, but there's, I'll put it this way, it seems like there's an audience for all kinds of music. So yeah. I'm, I'm learning in my older age to not be so discriminatory yeah. uh, 
and say that uh, I, I, I tend to look at what Duke Ellington is saying. It's, only, it's either good music or bad music, but yeah. even bad music, I think there's people buying it. So who am I? If someone yeah. is making something that maybe not my cup of tea, but someone else decides that you know they're going to purchase it, then you know what? All I can say is, you know, praise God. You know, I'm, I'm with you on that. Let, <laughs> you know? let, let me ask. Uh, I want to ask you this question. But uh, before I do that, uh, Kevin or Ken, can you bring Greg and the Delta back uh, for the Q&A session? Because um, I, I want to make sure that we honor our time and, and, and get everybody in here. But, Ron, I want to ask you this question, because we've we talked about the engagement of the creative <laughs> artists and the audience or the participants or those who are uh, experiencing the music that we make. I want to talk to you about what happens when you have musicians who are coming together to play, who are different faiths, Mm -hmm. are different ethnicities, are different genders, and perhaps don't even speak the same language. Can you talk about the power that happens when we're able to speak the language of musical love in what we do? Well, it, for me, I, in, in being in that, that kind of situation, um, it's, um, it's, it's, it's sort of like it's magic in a sense that verbally we can't communicate, but when we pick up the instruments, we can go different places. We can uh, communicate on that level. We can, um, we can strike up something that, that seems to be pleasing to all the participants and hopefully to those who are listening. So I, I would say that's, uh, um, especially if, you, if you're uh, what I call a, a, an unselfish musician who, who's willing to, or he or she is willing to, to uh, be more of an accommodationist mm-hmm. to the others, help the others to have a good time first. Mm-hmm. And then I think when it's your turn or even they will reciprocate and understand that this thing is about a uh, 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 supportive mechanism. You see how people, um, I, I go, I go, I use this analogy, how cheerleaders build this kind of like pyramid kind of thing. And, you know, it, as long as everyone holds their weight and when it gets to the person at the top, mm-hmm. I mean, it's, it's, it's a wonderful thing. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. there's no one person that's better than anyone else. It's just everyone is there for that common purpose. That's, that's, that's powerful. I want to, um, I'm sorry. Invite invite the folks who are with us uh, on the Zoom. Please populate the chat with questions uh, so that we can ask these questions. Steffi, I see your question. I'm going to ask that question shortly. But I want Nadelka to respond to that same question. And after Nadelka, Greg, I want you to respond to that same question because I know that we've all had that experience. And I just want you to share with the, with the audience about that. Two, two things that I think about. Um... And I always hold to this. It makes me think of in those moments when uh, the music transcends all the things that supposedly um, divide us. It reminds me of the book of Acts when everyone went, was in one accord. Mm-hmm. Um, all the different languages, but yet everyone was understanding and had this one connection, was able to do this, to be in one spirit. But then I also remember, and this is something that I talk with students about, like translating what it means to be in the Holy Spirit but um, also making it um, clear for those who don't use that kind of language. And it reminds me of one time I went to Bean uh, Jazz Bean Fest, Bean Town, mm-hmm. and um, Snarky Puppy was playing. And my son was there and, you know, he's, he's in this stage of his life where he wants to have his own say and have his own thoughts. And so I don't pressure him about um, God talk because mm-hmm. um, I don't want to push him away. That's, I trust that's something he's going to figure out for himself. But he always mentions this concert that we went to with Snarky Puppy, and I had the same feeling, which makes me feel like, yes, God. Um, we were there, and I remember looking, it was a beautiful, warm day, and I remember looking across the expanse of bodies that were watching and experiencing this live performance, and I remember seeing the audience just bumping to the beat, just mm-hmm. a, like a wave. 
up and down. And I remember feeling in this one moment, I, I started feeling overcome by the spirit that was happening. And I could see it transcending in the space when everyone was all together. And I know I wasn't crazy because it's something that my son speaks about as well. And for me, it speaks to the power of when we just come together for the good of the music. Yeah. When we just all submit to what is needed in the moment and make pretty and make beautiful and make good. And I could visibly see it. So I know it's a tangible thing that we humans can do. And that to me is the power of music that mm. we can raise the vibration and see it in the body and feel it as a wave of energy and agree upon it. Even though we have different ways of talking about it, we know what we're talking about. We Powerful. all experienced it. Powerful. Come on in, Greg. Come on in. Uh, I mean, I'm not, I'm not sure if there's anything left to say because I, I, I wholeheartedly believe in, in both with uh, Nadelka and uh, Ron uh, already have said. You know, what I'm thinking about to your question of, you know, like, what's it like? How do you experience or uh, live the experience of performing music or playing this music with folks who may be from different uh, walks of life or faith? I think, yeah, maybe this is a, this is not, a, you know, certainly any, isn't a part of any doctrine when I say this, but I mean, I, I believe this music draws people and this could be a, a microcosm of what the world could be like. I've heard, you know, obviously you hear Witt talk about, you know, jazz music being the greatest form of democracy. Right? Mm -hmm. Ron spoke about being selfless, uh, Delta as well, you know, I mean, these are all things that this music represents and being on one accord, as she, she just said as well. So when I think about it, no matter what the faith is that you belong to, what you subscribe to, what your spirituality is, I think we're all, in some book somewhere, we're all called to love each other. Right. And I think that when I think about the music that I make with people and why I consider to play this music and why I continue to play this music, and I'm thinking about all the folks I play with now, thinking, uh, you know, Concert. I don't know why, Kevin, I keep seeing Max in my head right now. I'm thinking about him. Like people that I love dearly, people that I've come yeah. up with for a long time, I love them. And, yeah. and this music draws us all together and, and it provides a space for that. And I think whenever, I think people who are, who are good and, and people who are coming from that space, um, whatever you believe in, when you come to this area and when you're, you're creating, you're being selfless, you're playing this music and you are on one accord, that's a space for us to act, to act and to do what we're all called to do based on what these books say we're supposed to do, which is love each other and heal each other and provide that space of uh, compassion um, and that space for dialogue and that space for friction too. All that can exist, but in love. Um, so I think that's why you're drawn to this music. You might not realize it at first when you're going to listen to it, uh, but that's something that keeps bringing people back, both the listeners and the people who perform it. Like I get a chance to perform music with people I love and care about. And uh, that's also what I'm called to do as a Christian, right? And yeah. it's all what, also what Rod's called to do as well. So I mean, we're all yeah. called to do that as people. Yeah. yeah. If, we, yeah. if we never lose sight of that, if we bring that to the table when we play, uh, that's where the best music is created, but that's where the best humanity is created as well. So. Mm -hmm. It's beautifully stated, man. It, and, 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 and that was not said before. So I'm glad you said it. That was, that <laughs> was beautiful. Can I just tag in there for a second? <laughs> mm -hmm. That's something that, and, and this is being assisted to, to Brother Ron in the ensemble department at Berkeley. This is the kind of thing that we get to work on as ensemble teachers. We mm -hmm. get to work with students on practicing their humanity. Mm -hmm. That in every, dis, every moment they get to make a decision again and again. And this is what we talk about in relationships and in marriage. You get to make that decision again and again, how you're gonna show up um, and, and make the love happen and, and, and practice it. And so that to me is also the beauty of music that we actually, as Greg said, get to practice our humanity. That's powerful, powerful. We got two questions here. Ron, the first one's coming to you. Uh, and it's gonna go back to a love supreme and the notion of Allah Supreme. You introduced the 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 notion that the uh perhaps a record label or uh, folks were not comfortable with Allah Supreme. The question here from Steffi is what were the political underpinning of changing the name? And was it Islamophobia or concern for connection to the nation of Islam? I want you to answer that. And then, uh, Greg, I, I, I think I see a home team question, if I can see who it's from. But the question is extremely important. What inspired the Negro Spiritual Songbook? Let's have you both answer those questions. 
All right. Um, I would say if you look at what was happening in this country, say, early 60s, um, they weren't, I don't think the society or even record execs uh, were ready for such a radical change uh, in a sense of um, someone stepping out and, and, and using that kind of language. Um, you look at the the treatment of uh, the, the so-called Negro during that time, mm -hmm. the treatment of women, you know, um, during that time. So I think the country was in a place where it wasn't a comfortable time or the right time to introduce that kind of thing. Even though you had musicians who were who were professing the Islamic faith, uh, who were practicing, who were doing whatever, but it wasn't like they were waving any kind of flags to you know uh, say that yeah here I am da 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 da. You know they were very careful you know with with that because they knew that you know the political climate and just people's attitude towards something that wasn't that was uncommon in their eyes, uh, they weren't as accepting of that that mm -hmm. type of thing. And I think the other side of that would have been uh, Coltrane was a very popular artist at that time. And so uh, record sales probably would have tanked had they went the other route. So, yeah. you, I mean, you know, as a record exec, you know, they, they their biggest thing is making money. So especially, you know, someone who was a major artist like, you know, Coltrane, you know, yeah. so yeah, that was that would be my my answer. Unless, I mean, now I, I would say someone like uh, um, my brother Eric Jackson, he might have a, 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 a better answer or maybe something he can add to that he might know that I don't know. Of, you know? Eric, we know you're here, man. Come off mute for a quick second. Give 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 us a couple minutes, brother. We know you're here. It's okay, fine. Yeah, uh, just uh, just want to let everybody know I uh, have uh, uh, thoroughly enjoyed uh, the presentation this evening. I, I think that there, uh, as Ron said, there have been practicing Muslims since at least the um, the 1940s. There was a, a growing mo movement uh, among African Americans, especially. Uh, a group of Muslims who were known as Ahmadiyyas. Mm -hmm. They had a very strong push in the uh, African-American community. With the coming of uh, Malcolm X, who of course is one of the followers of Elijah Muhammad, uh, I think that's what really pushed uh, Islam and um, uh, uh, the term Allah, because they did use Allah the term Allah in the nation of Islam. Mm -hmm. um, so, and I think another good friend of John Coltrane's was the organist uh, Larry Young, mm -hmm. Khalid Yassin, who was uh, at least studying the teachings of uh, uh, Elijah Muhammad. Uh, so that uh, I'm not sure that, uh, I, I, I do think there, were, there was probably some reason to be concerned how the record companies would react. And I don't doubt that there were some record companies who would have said no uh, to, uh, to using the name like that. Remember, it wasn't until uh, very late in the 50s, and maybe it was the early 60s even, when black people were allowed to be on the covers about mm -hmm. themselves. So that, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, because that was that was the money. You're not messing with the money. You can do what you want <laughs> musically, but don't mess with the money. And so I, I do think that that was, would have been a concern for a number of the record companies. And it wasn't until probably around the 70s that the record companies started allowing, the beginning of the 70s, late 60s, when record companies started allowing more and more artists, especially Impulse label, started allowing more and more uh, um, artists to use words. And many of uh, uh, the artists then began to uh, show their spiritual beliefs in the words uh, of the songs that they were, of course, you know, Humala, 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 mm -hmm. from Pharaoh Sanders. 
and there were other people who were dealing with other kinds of uh, ideas musically. But I think that's a, a definite uh, uh, concern was for the rec uh, record companies. I don't think that the musicians were as afraid to use the term as I think the record companies were not only just afraid, but forbidden. They would, wouldn't even, uh, no, you're not doing that, man. no, no. <laughs> <laughs> beautiful thank thank you eric uh the eric jackson dean of boston jazz radio board member of jazz boston the living legend the living legend we're so grateful that you're here with us tonight thanks eric thank you thank you greg talk to us about the negro spiritual songbook inspiration yeah um the, the well it's 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 fitting that um that Hampton Garrett, you know, folks over there who are watching, because truth be told, I mean, I, I talk about Charles Street as my home church and hearing spirituals, um, but really, I mean, the, the appreciation of spirituals came from where I actually started playing music, which is at the Hampton Garrett Music and Arts Academy. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a, a program that's still housed right here in Roxbury um, that teaches the importance of spirituals and uses that as a lens to teach this music. Um, and that, you know, you know, you can use Bach and Amigo Spiritual and get the same great information and both should be respected the same. So our children should be learning both. Mm -hmm. um, it was, um, it's named after Ruth Hamilton. Mm -hmm. um, and for those who don't know, Ruth Hamilton was a powerhouse, uh, uh, amazing operatic singer, but also wonderful uh, vocalist in the gospel and Amigo Spiritual tradition. And she was a member of Charles Street. Um, so when I was wow. a child, she was a member there and, um, and was, you know, had the chance to, from what I understand, sing for Dr. King as well as sitting president. So like was doing a lot of great things and um, mentored a really phenomenal vocalist who's still living with us here today and still performing and still singing regularly, Elta Garrett. Oh yes. I know and love mm -hmm. who was not only, and the reason why I teach in many ways, um, not only a phenomenal singer and, and carries on Luke Hamilton's tradition of spirituals and um, herself, but also was an educator in the Boston public school system for many, many years. I don't, I don't, I don't want to guess, but I, I want to say it was almost 40 years, if not wow. that. Well, so I mean, and continue to teach even after retirement at Hamilton Garrett, and then also donating, giving her time at, um, at in the Boston public school system. So that's where it started, and it, it stemmed from as before, you know, having a chance to. Um, when I was doing my thesis pro project, and I started to make these connections, um, creating this music where I'm still highlighting it and honoring the tradition where sister so-and-so or brother so-and-so could hear the melodies and say, yes, that's the, that's the melody that my mom would sing to me or vice versa. Um, but then also say, oh, wow, I hear where you're coming from, but not hopefully not have it lose uh, the intangibles of the music and the sacredness of it, but also by not limiting the things that I'm doing as a musician, not stifling that in the jazz sense as well. Um, just having it be one area where they both coexist. Awesome, man. Thank you for... Uh, uh, Emma, Emma, yeah, yeah please, I come just, on. Uh, I just want to say, basically, I think that uh, Grover answered the quest, that question in his presentation, where yes. he gave the, uh, the message songs and the uh, songs the hope, of hope. hope. Mm -hmm. Those are, uh, to me, what the, spirit, the spirituals were, the religious music of the slaves. Mm -hmm. And th that was what uh, those songs were about. They were maybe I would add uh, consolation as as a division of the hope part, but I think those are, that's that's how the spirituals uh, came about. They were to give hope. They were to be used as uh, message songs and consolation. Uh, that's right. For like, for example, members don't get re weary was used to sing when yeah. somebody couldn't go on the underground railroad. Mm -hmm. For some reason, they could go on this trip, and so they would sing. Members don't get weary, you know. Uh, now that's <laughs> that's, that's beautiful. Y'all yeah. keep keep Eric here with us because I have one more question that I want to do round robin, and I'm gonna set it up, and I want your quick response. I don't want you to think about it. I don't want you to pontificate about it. I don't want you to explore and get all contemplative and, and, and meditate about it. I want your quick response to this question. And then after we go around, Robin, I'm going to throw this back to Ken. So for those of you, uh, we know that we said it may go to nine. We're just going to go a few minutes over. So hang in here because you do not want to miss this. Here's the question. 
my dear beloved mentor, dear big brother and legend who we all knew and loved, Dr. Leonard Brown, used to always ask this question. For the 15 years that I taught by him, taught beside him and, you know, traveled the world with him and, and did what not, he would always ask this one question. Here's the question coming at you, Greg, first. What does music mean to you? <laughs> uh, if, I'm, if I'm being honest, just source of joy. And I know that it also represents a lot of other things. But for me, I can, I can, whether I'm in a car, whether I'm playing music, listening with other folks, it's, a, it's really a space where I can experience joy, <clears throat> transmit Beautiful. joy. To Beautiful. Nadelka, what does music mean to you? Uh, journey into true self beautiful beautiful ron god what does freedom music mean? freedom and uh a sense of joy as a listener but freedom as a musician playing the bass eric jackson you heard him ask this question much longer than i did what does music mean to you i'd, I'd go with the the joy, I'd go with the hope, and I would also add in uh, prayer. Hmm. Uh, it's it's certainly all of those things. That's that's one of the reasons why I fell in love with the music, is because I was in need of a prayer, and John Coltrane uh, uh, touched me in such a way that uh, that was my prayer. Hmm. Came the prayer, love hmm. supreme in particular. Hmm. Beloved, thank you. Greg Groover Jr., Nadelka Prescott, Ron McD, the great Eric Jackson making a phenomenal appearance. It has been great to be with you all. Thank you for your participation. Thank you for joining us. Thank Jazz Boston. Thank the leaders uh, for this event, Ken and Karen, uh, Kevin. Ken, I'm throwing it back to you. You're up, my brother. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I want to actually bring Kevin back in here, too, just because I really appreciate what he's done um, and uh, what we've done together to put together this series of uh, uh, forums. I, I want to thank you, Emmett, and I, I kind of want to throw your own question back at you, right? I mean, uh, what happened? How come you didn't answer your question? <laughs> do you want to do you want to go ahead and uh, uh, have a have a shot at that? To me, uh, music is love. It's, it's, it's the greatest expressive force to exemplify and to show love. Beautiful. How about you, Kevin? Uh, I think the first word that comes to my mind is integrity. You know, love, love and integrity, a trueness to oneself. And kind of like what Nadelka, Greg, also, Ron all pointed out there's a connectedness that comes from person to person as we all connect together because of that integrity, you know, spiritually speaking, also musically speaking, like there's a certain integrity that only happens uh, when we connect like that. So, yes. Hey, so, again, I, I wanted to just kind of point out one thing. Please. Uh, there, there was some curiosity in the chat um, about the overlap. Uh, in particular of uh, Black gospel music and jazz musicians. And I just wanted to throw out a few names for those of, those of us who are curious about that overlap. And historically speaking, I want to suggest to a few people to check out um, Georgia Tom, who is the, the composer of over 400 different blues, also known as Tom, Thomas Dorsey, that will go on to write uh, Precious Lord. I mean, of course, we can check out the content of um, Aretha Franklin, who walks, live in both of those worlds, Sam Cooke. Uh, you know, it's, it's just a lot of people that can be uh, checked out. So I just want to throw out those people because it's, I mean, we are jazz musicians, of course, but this overlap has just kind of permeated American music as we know it. And we could all go on for just like hours and hours in regards to this, but uh, it's just kind of very important that overlap is just all throughout this beautiful music we have. Uh, that is American music. So, so sorry to kind of deviate there, but I just wanted to 
say that really quick. That's not even a deviation, right? <laughs> but thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Emmett, Ron, uh, Gregory, Nadelka, Eric, Kevin. Um, I want to also make sure I, I don't forget to thank uh, the Mayor's Office of Art and Culture, who, through their Opportunity Fund grant, uh, helped uh, support this, this forum. So thanks very much to them. And, you know, this is such a deep uh, and uh, uh, thoughtful and, uh, you know, smart conversation. Uh, I, I really appreciated it myself. But I want to, I want, if I could get a little personal right now about myself. Um, and to close out, I just want to share a, a deeply spiritual moment for me. Uh, and it happened 10 years ago. And it happened at the memorial for my late wife, Karen Aqua. Uh, I uh, stood up at the end of uh, that memorial in front of 400 people, and I played at her request, uh, I'll Fly Away, as a solo, uh, solo saxophone player. And as I played that melody slowly uh, and deeply, my friends came up one at a time and joined me musically, played music with me. And, you know, I get choked up just thinking about it and talking about it. Uh, and uh, by the end of that, we had uh, about 20 musicians up on the stage, all playing I'll Fly Away. And we paused and we brought it up tempo and we did a second line down the street. Uh, and the whole 400 people followed us. And, you know, uh, I'll say I'm not a religious person in the tr traditional sense, but that was uh, a deeply spiritual moment for me, as I'm sure you can imagine. And it brought together my, uh, my musical interests and uh, my personal life and my spirituality. So uh, this, this forum has, uh, has really uh, brought all of that uh, and much more uh, to, to all of us. I want to thank everybody for who attending. We had a really nice group of people attending. I recognize a lot of names. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, once again, thanks to Emmett for uh, for stepping up and hosting. Uh, uh, really appreciate that. And I hope. Uh, and also, one more thing, I want to send out our love and uh, good wishes uh, to Annette Phillip, who's going through a little bit of a, a bump. And so uh, we wish her uh, uh, smooth sailing uh, into the future. So thanks so much, everybody. Uh, Y'all. You want to close it on out, Kevin? I think I think you broke it up there for a second. <laughs> but thank you all so much for for joining us. Thank you so much, Ryan, Greg, Delka, Emmett. Thank you for hosting, uh, Eric. Uh, love love y'all a ton. And uh, I guess we, we as we say, uh, we we'll catch you on the flip side. Yeah. <laughs> all right, y'all. Thank you.